welcome to the Psychology Podcast, where we give you insights into the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity. I'm Dr. Scott Barry Kaufman, and in each episode, I have a conversation with a guest who will stimulate your mind and give you a greater understanding of yourself, others, and the world we live in. Hopefully, we'll also provide a glimpse into human possibility. Thanks for listening and enjoy the podcast. So today we have Michael Pipich on the podcast. Pipich is a licensed marriage and family therapist and has treated a wide range of mental disorders and relationship problems in adults and adolescents for over 30 years. Michael is also a national speaker on bipolar disorder and has been featured on radio and in print media on a variety of topics. His latest book is called Owning Bipolar, How Patients and Families Can Take Control of Bipolar Disorder. Michael, really great to chat with you today. Thank you very much for having me, Scott. It's a pleasure to be here. Glad to hear that. This is a topic that we have not covered yet on the Psychology Podcast, so I think it's it'll be a great service to our listeners. So, five is this statistic true that five percent of the population suffers from bipolar disorder, or about three hundred fifty million people worldwide? Well, it, depending on what research you take a look at, I've reviewed research that suggests anything from one to two percent, all the way up to five percent, and I think. The more recent data suggests that as we get better at identifying bipolar disorder, that number will probably hold out. And so if you take 5% of the population worldwide, yeah, that comes out to 350 million people, thereabouts. And, you know, one in 20 people that you you meet over a course of day or pass on the sidewalk uh, likely has some form of bipolar disorder. I mean, that's a big deal. Jeez. So I want to really... Talk about this, though. When you say has bipolar disorder, I mean, all these things are just labels at the end of the day. I mean, there's a constellation of characteristics that, you know, go underneath those labels. But, you know, there was no like Ten Commandments from God saying like, this person has bipolar, this person doesn't, you know. So, I'd love to hear your thoughts on how you define bipolar and what you see as some of the main characteristics of it. Absolutely. I think it's important to talk about it, particularly because the more that we as a larger community discuss bipolar disorder, I think even though that's very important and that's a big reason, of course, that I wrote the book and you and I are having this conversation today, but we know that particularly when it comes to psychological terms and particularly certain mental disorders, it becomes risky to kind of use it in casual conversation. Like somebody said, you know, I think she's really bipolar, not meant to be a diagnostic suggestion, but kind of just to talk about characteristics in a way that, again, is kind of casual, but may turn out to be demeaning and in itself a misidentifier. I think, uh, Scott, when we talk about what is bipolar disorder and how to distinguish it, it's, I, I think it's important to talk about at least a little bit of the history of what uh, had historically been called manic depression. And we have evidence dating back to the ancient Greek physicians that mm. uh, chronicled uh, patients that had these extreme mood swings as mania and depression, or maybe described as melancholy and so forth, through the ages. But only recently did we describe it as bipolar disorder, and exactly what that term suggests. There are two extreme poles of emotional experience, just as we kind of think of the globe as having a North Pole and a South Pole, and that represents the furthest points on the globe. In bipolar disorder, we're talking about the furthest points of a mood state where a person experiences very extreme periods, what we could describe as mania, very precisely and also somewhat generically because there's other forms of it such as hypomania and so forth. But those symptoms include a very expansive, euphoric type of mood state that's consistent over a period of time, not something that somebody necessarily experiences very quickly in relation to something that wonderful that's happened in their life. But because of a certain biochemical neurological change, they experience a persistent type of either euphoric, expansive mood, uh, suggesting of feelings of grandiosity and just wonderfulness, to the possibility of very irritable, dysphoric type of mania. Hmm. And alongside those symptoms, either way, uh, whether you have euphoria or dysphoria or some combination of that, during that period of time, there is uh, often a decreased need for sleep, where the individual doesn't really necessarily try to sleep or want to sleep, but in the case of somebody who's experiencing mania, they they don't want to sleep, they want to stay up, and they want to do all kinds of different things, and under the assumption that they're hyperproductive or hypercreative. 
alongside those symptoms uh, is pressured speech, flight of ideas, as, as if they become experts in all kinds of different issues and then feel like they uh, have so much to give in that moment and, and try to, through various activities, experience a sense of productivity and output uh, that they can't in any other time without that mood state. Also, and I think most notably, they can experience very high levels of impulsive drive, which uh, may turn out to be uh, very harmful kinds of activities like shopping sprees or hypersexuality and other kinds of discretions that is that what happens to me every time i go that's what happens to me every time i go to the apple store (laughs) yeah but if you have a drive to go to the apple store for several days in a row and exhaust all of your financial means on all kinds of gadgets and stuff that that of course you wouldn't need necessarily that's probably indicative more of something that would be we would describe as as manic Hmm. On the other side of that pole is a profound sense of depression. Again, that lasts consistently over a period of time. Uh, Diagnostically, it has to be at least uh, two weeks for it to qualify as an episode of major depression. Hmm. So again, bipolar disorder is is something that is experienced in these extreme mood states where an individual can, again, experience uh, and and have to live with uh, very severe consequences of, of their behavior, which often can be uncharacteristic of who they are and what they typically do when they're not in those mood states. Okay, so that's an that's a really um, good caveat there at the end. Thank you for outlining that. Just wanted to take this moment to thank you all for your support of the podcast over the years. It's been a real privilege to do this podcast for you all for the past four years. It's been a real labor of love. If you'd like to further support the podcast, I wanted to let you know a few things you could do to help make it a better experience for you all. First, I'd really appreciate it if you could subscribe to the Psychology Podcast on iTunes. This would help make the show more prominent on iTunes and increase our listenership. I believe you can subscribe both on your iPhone and on your computer. Second, it'd be great if you could give the show a rating and review on iTunes. I definitely read all the reviews, and they're helpful to others who are thinking about giving the show a listen. Another thing you can do is donate something to the show. Even just the price of a cup of coffee would really help me continue to do this podcast for you all. To donate something, you can go to thepsychologypodcast.com and click on the link at the bottom that says Become a Sponsor. So thanks again for your incredible support of the show over the years. You know, I do this show for you all because I truly love sharing my enthusiasm and love of the mind, brain, and creativity, and I really appreciate you joining me on this journey. Okay, now back to the show. Now, there are different gradations. I'm not fully up on everything, but there's like bipolar 1, bipolar 2, right? Aren't there like, isn't there like a milder form of Bipolar, where you have more of the mania than the depression, and that's classified as something. Is this right? Well, there's there's three basic types, okay. and then within those, there are certain qualifiers that that we see in the DSM that kind of helps us to sort of you know, specify varieties uh, along a, a continuum. But those three basic types are bipolar one disorder, bipolar okay. two disorder, and then cyclothymia. I guess you can almost describe that as bipolar three, though. People don't technically use that term, but we really look at mostly bipolar one and bipolar two. And bipolar one okay. basically is diagnosed when an individual has a history, not necessarily in the present moment, but some history, at least one episode of mania in their life, uh, where they have those symptoms that I just spoke of, but they have it for at least seven days in a row. Uh, sometimes it goes on much longer than that. The only caveat there is that if they are hospitalized and untreated, intervened at some level, that could interrupt that seven-day period, but that would be considered a diagnostic of bipolar 1. Bipolar 2, sometimes people, and, and I think we used to think this way, but this, this idea is changing, that bipolar 2 is sort of a lesser form of bipolar 1, sort of like bipolar light, if you will, uh, but we don't really think of that quite in those terms. Bipolar 2 is diagnosed if there is at mm. least one hypomanic episode, which are all the symptoms that I just spoke of, but have shorter duration. Okay. Uh, they could be at least uh, four days in length, or okay. either as a consequence of a shorter duration compared to bipolar one, or just because the consequences may not be as uh, fully actualized as you might see in bipolar one. Uh, hypomania uh, by itself, as a, as a single episode, is uh, typically looked at as, uh, as less consequential than what you would see in what sometimes people call full-blown mania, 
in the, on that bipolar one side. But people with bipolar two not only have to have that one episode of hypomania, but they also have to have one episode of major depression, which is not a part of bipolar one diagnostically. So because people with bipolar two are only considered having that diagnosis, they have a period of depression along with the hypomania. We no longer think of it as a lesser form of the disorder because the de depression itself may be very, very devastating. Mm -hmm. uh, people with bipolar two can suffer many, many consequences of their disorder, in including a very high rate of, uh, of suicide potential. Yikes. What are the rates of suicide in people who have been diagnosed with bipolar? Yeah, so we know that, that bipolar in general, bipolar 1 and 2 and, and, its, and its variants, collectively, individual that has some form of bipolar disorder is at least 20 times more at risk for suicide than wow. anyone else population, at least 20%. There's some research suggesting up to 30%. And in the DSM-5 itself, it, it does mention that one-fourth of all deaths by suicide may be attributable to bipolar disorder itself. And in this country alone, that's over 10,000 lives lost every year. Well, let me ask you a question. What's the breakdown of people who have committed suicide in a manic state versus a depressive state? I often get asked that question, and it always compels me to kind of look in deep, more deeply into the research to see if, in fact, there are differences there. So the best that I can understand, and in working with people with bipolar disorder who have expressed suicidal ideation, my best answer to your question is that it really can occur in any mood zone across that single spectrum from the very worst form of mania. And by the way, uh, in bipolar one, uh, you can have psychotic features associated with your manic episode, yeah. hallucinations and delusions and so forth. So from the very worst form, which is a psychotic type of mania, across the board to the very worst form of depression, which we would probably expect to be the most pernicious time for anybody, uh, particularly with respect to self-harm and suicide. Still, I think that suicide potential in an individual bipolar can occur at any point across that spectrum even when they're not in a severe mood state and more of a baseline uh, position. And I think the reason for that, Scott, is that very often when people, sort of their moods sort of retreat to that middle ground or that baseline zone, especially when they're not in treatment, they can become uh, aware of the damage that they might have uh, enacted as a result of these extreme mood events mm. and become more aware of it. So it's not as if, phew, I'm baseline, so I'm feeling great now. So they or feel, I feel guilt? Hey, and I'm not suicidal. Or they may be, that might be their moment of reflection when they've, when they've seen the damage that has been created and as they as they kind of gone through either of those mood events. So I think that, again, that suicidal potential exists across uh, those mood states in somebody that has bipolar disorder. Wow. Well, this is really, really important stuff. I'd really like to hear about your three-phase approach to treating patients with bipolar. Because you argue that it goes beyond the usual treatment that's centered on getting patients on meds and keeping them there. Could you maybe talk a little about that approach? Yeah, absolutely. I'd be happy to. So, and I explained this in Owning Bipolar for patients and families to better understand uh, those particular treatment needs. But I think, again, it's, you know, th these are kinds of things that I think it's important to understand community wide. And, and hopefully, treatment professionals can also adopt some of these this framework and the objectives contained within it. So the three-phase approach is centered around the medical stabilization bipolar mood swings, with the centerpiece of the treatment being medications and how those medications are first prescribed and then monitored towards kind of setting an ideal place for any individual with bipolar disorder, knowing that everybody has different kinds of medical needs and different body chemistry and so forth requiring, you know, whatever medications are most appropriate for them. But uh, like you said, it's, it's not limited to that. You know, I found, if I can just say this quickly, and then I can talk about the spaces kind of as a little bit of a background. I found that before I uh, delved into this research and began constructing these three phases, that the predominant treatment approach for many years, particularly since lithium kind of hit the scene in North America during the 1970s and early 80s, was that because the medication lithium and then later other mood stabilizers were so effective, it seemed to, for a lot of people, just replace the need for talk therapy, which was largely ineffective before those medications were made available. 
And I think a couple of generations of therapists uh, since then really have not gotten the training necessary to look at it more comprehensively in terms of what's necessary for the treatment overall of bipolar disorder. So having said that, the three phases begin with the pre-stabilization phase. That's the first phase. That's marked by some sort of crisis related to bipolar disorder that's being presented to treatment. And, and sometimes that's not really so noticeable as bipolar symptoms themselves, but some sort of crisis. It might be a crisis in the relationship, uh, financial, work-related problems, and, uh, or health-related problems. Uh, it's not unusual for me to get a referral from the court system or from an attorney that believes that the, the client has gotten in trouble probably and maybe repeatedly and may have some sort of mental illness that's driving that very often that could be bipolar mania. In that pre-stabilization phase, there may be other presenting issues, of substance abuse being a big one as well, by the way. But that's the time when um, if uh, any evidence of mood swings, either by that individual's personal history or through their family history, since bipolar is genetically weighted pretty heavily, we find uh, the possibility of bipolar, then other uh, treatment needs are essentially set aside in favor of really assessing for bipolar disorder. And during that pre-stabilization phase, not only is there a crisis going on that needs that attention, an assessment for the possibility of a bipolar diagnosis, but we also expect during that period of time, pre-stabilization, that there, to one extent or another, is the defense or coping mechanism, if you will, of denial, not dissimilar from what you see with substance abuse disorders and, and sobriety and, and addiction recovery. People who have bipolar disorder very often don't want to give up the perceived beneficial aspects of maintenance, mm -hmm. such as creativity and productivity and energy and feeling really alive. But also at a deeper level, they may fear giving up what they have always experienced as an offset to depression and lethargy and lack of productivity and low self-esteem. So very often, to one extent or another, a person is going to want to guard that and guard against any possibility of bipolar di a bipolar diagnosis and the suggestion of treatment and so forth. So there's a lot of fears that go hand in hand with that uh, particular phase of their Are care. any of those fears founded? Like, do you find that when you treat people, does their aliveness go away? Well, you know, that is a very important piece of treatment that is addressed as we go through those other phases. Okay, so I'll just stop talking and listen to your phases. <laughs> no, but it, I mean, it's an excellent question. And it is something that, you know, presents itself, I think, in one way or another in that pre-stabilization phase. You know, if, okay, so if I do have this problem and if I do get treatment, what's going to happen to me? So it is something that we kind of begin to take a look at uh, in that pre-stabilization phase, but really focus on as they go through stabilization, which is the second phase. So as we address that with the individual in that particular phase, we also, if possible, uh, try to bring in one or two, at the minimum, family members, loved ones that the patient has identified as being somebody close to them in their life. Obviously, if it's a child, it will be a parent or two, uh, depending on their circumstances. Certainly for an individual who's uh, married or in an intimate relationship, it would be their partner, spouse. For an older individual, maybe a caregiver, perhaps an adult child or sibling. But hopefully some family member that uh, is, can be in a trusted and somewhat observational type of position relative to that individual and, and begin to help them with education too, because very often those individuals can be in some level of denial too. Not so much in terms of their experience of the consequences of bipolar, but of the diagnostic label itself and what needs to be done for it. And that's particularly true, I think, with parents when, when, when the conversation begins about what's going on with their child. And I would expect that. So working through denial requires education, addressing their particular fears, mm. and also breaking down symptoms so that we don't get just caught into this idea of bipolar disorder is a bad thing when individuals very, very often want to protect certain aspects of it. So we kind of break down those symptoms between the perceived good and the obvious bad, if you will, and, and whatever makes the greatest amount of sense to that individual and that family to begin to say, hey, you know what, there is a treatment for these particular pieces of what you suffer with so that you don't have to suffer that anymore. So as we move from previous stabilization, we move together collaboratively into the second phase, which is stabilization, and where medications are a big part of the conversation. But okay. it's not just about medically stabilizing 
the mood in the individual with bipolar disorder. This is also about helping the family stabilize. And maybe that stabilization requires therapy and support. And maybe there's been so much trauma suffered by a family member or family members as a result of bipolar disorder that they may need their own therapy as well. But there's, a, there's sort of a comprehensive stabilization that requires medication on a medical level, but also on the social and familial levels to really begin to repair the damage that may have been done by bipolar disorder. Mm. And, 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 and that stabilization phase, is, it can be a very rough time for people. Sometimes you get somebody on medication, perhaps lithium or an anti-compulsant or whatever, and they do very well, and there's no apparent side effects, and it makes it easy for everyone. But as you probably know, that doesn't always happen. Sometimes there's some trial and experimentation that has to go on uh, during that period of time. And it can be very frustrating and people can feel like giving up sometimes, uh, particularly if they're experiencing some side effects, even if they're common side effects that can be easily resolved with time and attention. But these are all very pertinent issues and important for people to work through collaboratively and in a therapeutic context. So it's not just about sending a patient to a doctor and the doctor's going to prescribe and all will be well. There are so many issues contained with that. And in owning bipolar, I, I do spend time talking to the family members as well as the patients to make sure that everybody feels like they're a part of the process and whatever pain they're suffering, whatever they've gone through is relevant and, and can be addressed. And so as medications and the, and the whole stabilization process begins to take shape, we eventually move to that post-stabilization phase, that third phase. And that post-stabilization phase can be a very long period of time of treatment, because it really does represent a lifelong chronic illness management type of model. And and recognizing, in particular, a couple of features that I think are are very, very important to address. And the first of all, a person's identity, uh, their sense of self, can really change as a result of bipolar treatment. For the better, we would think. But remember that if bipolar is a genetic disorder, which we believe it is, it's something that that person has carried throughout their whole life. As a result of that, they have seen the world themselves and others through that bipolar prism of extreme mood events. And so reshaping how their brain handles uh, emotional regulation, while, again, we would expect to be a good thing, represents a real drastic change in how that person, again, perceives self and others. And like you suggested earlier, how they will see their own creative process, their own intellectual process, and what those uh, perhaps repercussions are for the long term. So we have to talk about that creative process and a person's ability to organize themselves in a more consistent fashion, rather than relying on manic energy to do kind of the work for them. And so there's a whole change in identity, but there's also changes in family dynamics that have to be addressed during that post-stabilization phase, which includes how the person with the bipolar condition and the loved ones around that person interact and talk about ongoing bipolar issues without making bipolar the centerpiece of their life. Because you know people with bipolar like to think that as they go through treatment, that they're starting to experience life more authentically and more in terms in, in relation to the reality of life around them. So it's not as if they're going to just stay in a baseline mood zone forever, uh, thanks to treatment. They're going to experience joys and sorrows and frustrations and anger and a whole range of what I think makes life, life colorful and, and sometimes enjoyable, but sometimes grief-stricken. So when a person with bipolar who's on a good management schedule and process through post-stabilization gets really angry about something, particularly a loved, something a loved one is doing, they don't want to think that the first thing the loved one is going to look at them and say, are you, are you off your meds? Mm. Uh, instead, uh, be able to have a, a, a conversation about what those feelings are in real time with, a, with an occasional you know, review in terms of how bipolar may kind of reassert itself in one way or another in their life. So these are some, of the, I think, of the, the highlights of that three-phase approach that, again, I talk about in Unwing Bipolar, and that I really stress when people come through that treatment process, that medications alone are not the answer, but a combination of medications and that ongoing therapeutic process and conversation with loved ones and supportive individuals to make a real comprehensive uh, life management a program for that individual, for the family, for long-term success. Mm. I appreciate that. 
you know, there's some research in the creativity literature suggesting that relatives of those who have full-blown bipolar tend to show increased levels of creativity. Kay Redfield Jameson has written a little bit about her own personal experiences with bipolar and creativity. Um, what do you what do you make of that hypothesis that that perhaps these traits in a, a sort of watered down version might be in a manageable version conducive to creativity? Well, what I what I have really found in my therapy work with people with bipolar disorder is that I believe that the creative process is um, is something that that essentially develops maybe to some extent uh, with regard to these mood extremes, but only on a, perhaps on an energy or motivational level. So for example, any one of us can, we can probably think of something that we're particularly good at. Okay. Uh, hopefully we can. I, I would think we all have gifts and uh, whether these things are kind of in the more traditional or classic idea of creativity, like people who are artistic or musical and that sort of thing. But I think creativity in general is is basically the ability to uh, solve problems from a, a unique perspective. It, it's basically how we solve a problem uh, outside of maybe again you know, a more conventional uh, means. And 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 if we kind of take that point of view for a moment, um, I think we all have gifts where we can look at things or uh, actuate certain things and affect outcomes. Uh, in a creative way, in a special way, in, in a way that we kind of maybe have our own process or our own signature applied to that. And and when I do that, I think it, it helps to kind of take it out of the realm of what we typically think about it, but very creative, eccentric people, uh, particularly those who may have had a bipolar disorder. And, and we can name some very famous people who were believed to have bipolar disorder, including Vincent van Gogh, Mozart, Abraham Lincoln, Winston Churchill used to describe his bipolar as his black dog. Mm. So these very, you know, well-known, obviously great leaders and great thinkers and who've produced a creative output in one way or another in ways that is hard to imagine for us mere mortals, if you will. You know, we, we tend to think of, of those kinds of individuals as having some sort of special process, maybe related to their madness, you know, that mm -hmm. whole fine line between genius and madness. But what I have found is that in sort of the ordinary, if you will, everyday person who may be suffering bipolar disorder, they, they still rely on that manic energy mm -hmm. as fuel for that process. And what I help them to try to understand very basically is that there's a difference between the process itself and the fuel for it. And and, and I realize that that's maybe somewhat controversial and, and, there, and there might be some people who disagree with that and that's fine. But that's my approach for the people that I work with. And and we, when we separate the pieces of the creative process, and we're less confused about that energy and motivational piece as being the process itself, aside from the necessary skills um, and practice of those skills and refinement of those skills, whatever they are, within that creative process, then we can see that perhaps we were just relying on bipolar mania to, to kind of do the work for us, rather than reinventing an organizational plan and a real scheme so that people who do have these creative gifts can learn to refine them and practice them in a more consistent way, rather than just in these peaks and valleys, depending on what their energy level is, you know, relative to their bipolar experience. Well, I, I do appreciate that that response, and I'm thinking about like specifically what aspects of it's mostly the mania that is linked to the creativity. Although I guess depression can be linked to certain forms of certain stages, like when you need to really focus and, and narrow your attention. But when you really want to generate lots of ideas and things, you know, you find sometimes that the personality trait hypomania is linked to divergent thinking. What do you make of that personality trait hypomania? It's not bipolar. It's just like a continuum that we're all on. Well, I think that's, that's an excellent point. And in fact, if we can just for a minute kind of go back to the sort of clinical diagnostic concept uh, where hypomania is concerned as a part of a bipolar 2 diagnosis. As you recall, I mentioned a moment ago that to have bipolar 2 as a diagnosis, you have to have at least one hypomanic episode and one major depressive episode. So if you remove the depressive aspect, hmm. then according to the DSM, you can have hypomania through your life and not really have a bipolar disorder. Now, you may have some problems associated 
But I think, again, from a diagnostic standpoint, there's, there's sort of a wink and a nod towards this from a sort of a personality or characterological standpoint, that there are people that do have these moments, uh, periods of intense energy, and as a result of that intense output. And, and again, it's kind of a fine line between, you know, is that genius or madness? Is that something that is acceptable or something that can be problematic? And it kind of lies on, on that fine line. But I think at least most recently in the DSM-5, there's, there's sort of that acknowledgement that, yeah, there are people, that, and I think you're kind of suggesting that, that have a trait that's, that's more embedded in their character that maybe causes them you know, fewer problems compared to those who, who meet that diagnostic criteria mm-hmm. in, its, you know, in the complete constellation of all those symptoms. That they can have a functioning life, and there may be some problems along the way, but again, nothing that kind of rises to a level of what we would call a mood disorder that that requires specific treatment and specific care. Right. So I've seen that too, and you know, I I, I feel like the whole DSM is moving towards a more dimensional model of all of these disorders, uh, recognizing that we're all in a continuum somewhere as opposed to either you have these things or you don't. So I think that's going to be probably the way, the future of psychiatry. Yeah, and I don't know if that makes it easier for us clinicians or more difficult. <laughs> frankly, yeah, you know? that's I a mean, really good so, point. It's so nice to be able to go look up symptoms and just check boxes and say, ah, there it is, you know. Yeah. But it doesn't, uh, and, and while that's certainly helpful, and I think it's relevant more often than not, it doesn't always, I think as you're implying here, it doesn't always give us sort of the full story of, of that individual's, you know, complete profile and what yeah. their experiences may be. Yeah, that's a good point. So, you're saying, you know, there's hope here that, that one can live with bipolar and thrive. And I'm trying to understand this phrase, owning bipolar. So, is part of the being able to thrive part, is part of it kind of an acceptance? Is that what you're getting at with that? You know what, Scott, that's a big part of it right yeah. there. Yeah. And sort of contemplating the overall theme of the book and eventually its title itself, it just made sense to me, particularly in our kind of current culture and in our parlance of everyday life, not to, not to say you have to own it in any kind of uh, jarring sort of way, but as a reminder, first of all, that bipolar disorder is, is a genetic disorder, which means it's nobody's fault that one well, has- it's your bipolar. parents' fault. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's the fault of their DNA. Yeah, uh, but yeah. Uh, you know we don't choose that anymore. Not their intentional people, right? action. Yeah, yeah. But still, their cause. <laughs> right. Actually, and you know, and I, I recall presenting these in a community presentation once. Said, you know, it's it's not the result of bad parenting, and and somebody chimed in, sort of like what you just did, and said, well, you know, can I curse my ancestry? And I said, well, you're welcome to do that, but it wasn't their fault either. It's just kind of how it's <laughs> you know evolved. Yeah, responsibility but, is not the same thing as blame. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly correct. So we know that it's not an excuse, it's an explanation uh, bipolar disorder. Mm. That it can make a good person do bad things, uh, very simply. And uh, Can it make a bad person do good things? I think that it could take somebody that has maybe certain narcissistic or antisocial traits, if you will, and, and make that even worse. But I think it's important to understand that uh, while uh, you know, some people with characterological disorders like narcissism or antisocial or sociopathy can also have bipolar disorder, I just think it's really important for us to understand as a larger community that the vast majority of people with bipolar disorder do not have those consistent kinds of personality deficits or flaws, that uh, they're everyday people. Just as people without bipolar disorder can be good people or maybe not so good people or whatever the mm. case might be. But I think it's important for those individuals to understand that as a matter of, among other things, you know, destigmatizing the disorder, but also for family members, to likewise, to look at their loved one and say, okay, uh, I can understand that this is a disorder that has created some very severe behavioral problems and damage to our finances, our relationships, et cetera. But if we, can, if we can own this together, if we can recognize it and own it together, we can find a pathway to good health mm. on a lifelong basis. And I think the other thing to understand about owning bipolar is that because it's a chronic mental illness, essentially, you know, you can't beat it. You know, there's no cure for it. 
And I think uh, whether it's a psychological or physical or however you categorize illnesses in general, you know, there's there's a compunction on all of us to to beat back whatever it is we have mm. and, and beat it and win. And that's not the approach that I think that serves people with bipolar disorder very well. Instead, it's about taking, like you said, responsibility for it and uh, responsibility for lifelong care together with your, your support system. And by working that together over the long haul, then it doesn't have to rule your life and, and dominate your life. It doesn't have to be the center of your life anymore. It can be on the periphery as long as we recognize that it needs uh, ongoing care. I like that. Can you give some tips on how you can support a family member who has bipolar? From the family member's perspective? You correct, mean, correct. You know, if, you have, if you have a loved one or even a friend. Right. I think, uh, you know, in that pre-stabilization phase, it can be very difficult, um, obviously. And if anybody needs a reference point, they can, again, kind of look at people with substance use disorders and, and how, you know, you want to kind of get to that loved one and say, hey, you know, you got a problem you, you, you really have to take a look at. And, and you know that at some level or another, you might be met with some resistance in that denial. Um, but I think that, first of all, it's important for loved ones, family members to obtain education in terms of what it is that, that we're dealing with together. And you might wind up having more education and more understanding, in this case, about bipolar disorder than the person with the condition, or even some treatment professionals who may just start to be a part of that process. So that awareness and understanding can be very empowering itself because you know what you're talking to. You're not always talking to that individual. You're talking to bipolar disorder and the denial that very often comes with it. So again, education is very, very important. And awareness is very important. And there's a lot of misinformation out there. So it's good to go to really good sources. Uh, from there, I think it's, if it's at all possible to have another loved one on your side, so to speak, mm. it's a powerful combina combination. I don't recommend that you go out and find 10 family members and try to convert them into you know, what it is that you're, that you're thinking about. But if you can find one or two other family members or friends to help you and guide you as you confront the bipolar disorder in that person that has the condition, that can be also very empowering and very supportive. So you don't feel like you're acting alone. Good. And then when you speak to that individual, you know, always remember that we can be firm and direct about these problem areas while maintaining our love and compassion for the individual, knowing again that bipolar is not their fault, but ultimately shared responsibility in taking care of that going forward. And if I can just, just kind of add one more piece to that, as that person does go through pre-stabilization, through stabilization into the final phase of post-stabilization, I think that family member walking with that person side by side is very important. But it's also, I think, equally important that the family member, as I kind of mentioned earlier, feels like they have their therapy and support along the way too, so that they feel edified uh, through that process, particularly when things may not be going in a positive direction right away, and build the conversation with their loved one of how they can work on long-term success together. That sounds wonderful. And, and I, I just want to come back to this point that, you know, I mean, is there a correlation between like bipolar and immorality? I mean, maybe there isn't, right? So like just because you have bipolar, just even though you have these up, you know, these, these highs, it doesn't may, mean that in those highs, you're more likely to do bad in the world, right? Like, isn't it possible to have mania to like, you know, want to make the world a better place just out of control? Certainly, that could be the intent of the individual. You know, a lot of times I find that people that go through uh, their extreme mood events, and in particular mania, carry with them, at least on the unconscious level, certain desires and fears and wishes of all kinds. And that power and that energy that takes over during mania can really push out a lot of those desires and fears from un the unconscious into behavioral expressions of one sort or another. While I think it's important to bear in mind that, like we said, bipolar media can take a good person and, and have them do you know, bad things, or at least you know, things that may be destructive to the things in, in life that are ultimately important to them, certainly a, a lot of people can feel when they're in the throes of that euphoric mania, like they can do anything and that they can save the world and, uh, and they have a very special mission that they're going to announce to the whole world. Mm. The underlying 
wish or desire or gift or skill, when we talked about creativity, may certainly be sincere, it may be real and authentic in its sort of raw state, if you will. Mm. But you're right. I mean, it can really get out of hand and out of control, even if that person is, if you will, well-meaning. Very often what happens, though, is that when that person is in that euphoric state and they have so much to give and they feel like they have a special mission for the world, very often because of their behavior will be met with resistance and that becomes extremely frustrating. And that's often when that mania turns from the euphoria to that extreme level of irritability and agitation. They just feel like everybody around them doesn't get their special purpose. And so that underlying mission or purpose or skill goes unsatisfied. And one of the things that I think we can expect through the three phases of bipolar therapy is the good that you suggest that people do possess can be affected and presented uh, in the lives of people around them in a, in a well-expressed and organized way through that proper care. That's very interesting. I'm thinking of the narcissism literature that I've, some recent research I've conducted sh- you know, showing uh, you know, there are these two forms of narcissism that exist, grandiose narcissism and vulnerable narcissism. Those who tend to, sh- to be more extroverted tend to display grandiose exhibitionist form of narcissism, whereas those who are more introverted tend to have this vulnerable, like grandiose fantasies in their own head kind of form of narcissism. But we recently published a paper with I published with Emmanuel Jock showing that the higher your scores on the grandiosity, the grandiose narcissism scale, beyond a certain threshold, like 75% threshold, you're actually more likely to then start to experience the vulnerable symptoms concurrently. Mm-hmm. And we think that's an important paper because these two forms of narcissism have tend to be treated as though you're they're two completely different kinds of people. But it seems like, you know, there is this level of grandiosity where you start to become much more vulnerable and actually think that you're a worthless human being. You're much more vulnerable to the opinions of others and things. And I'm wondering, I don't think anyone's done the study, but how does that fluctuation between grandiose and vulnerable narcissism map onto the fluctuations that you see in bipolar? I think that'd be an important clinical question. Yeah, I think that's a that's a fascinating point and how that may in some way, you know, intersect with that bipolar mania experience, you know, particularly on a when we think about, you know, beyond the symptoms themselves that we that we identify and diagnose on an objective level. You know, what is the subjective experience of that individual? I think that's that's so important. I talk about it in only bipolar, uh, that you know, people feel something. It's more than just the behavioral expressions and uh, the impulsivity that can get them in trouble, so to speak. But yeah. what's going on inside of them, you know, particularly when they're in the throes of mania? And I think what you're kind of talking about, you know, even though that's about narcissism that is more pervasive in an individual that has a, a personality disorder compared to bipolar disorder, which is episodic, that is to say that they may act very narcissistic when they're manic. But we would expect that to diminish as the, as that mood episode diminishes. Nonetheless, I think that their experience may be very much the same. And there are individual differences with respect to uh, extroversion versus introversion. Like you said, uh, you suggested that sort of grandiosity versus vulnerability, perhaps. And I think that people that experience bipolar, at least at that level, probably have very similar types of experiences in, in, in that way. Sure. Yeah. It'll be very interesting for future research to do that. So, but can people find an aliveness to the same intensity that they do when they have bipolar? I'm not sure you really answered that. So, I think there is, among other things, a redefinition of what being alive is all about. (laughs) That's a very good point. You know, uh, again, if you think of an individual who has seen himself through that bipolar lens, and that's been their experience by and large then that's how they've defined what it is to feel alive or, or how, what it's like to feel dead inside, you know. Through, once a stabilization is achieved, again, at that medical neurological level, you have an opportunity to work through those changes with that individual over a period of time. And with time and opportunity and therapeutic uh, interaction, that person begins to see themselves differently. And I think as a consequence, though, they see life differently. And, and again, what it is to be alive is a more consistent thing. And there are moments of joy and there are moments of sorrow, but you don't have to rely on extreme intensity to feel something. You can feel things and experience things in a more consistent, more authentic way. So, I mean, I think that that's a big part of what it is to to adapt to that new identity. 
Oh, it's such an important point. So your book concludes with personal action and helping others. So can you describe both of those elements? So what is the personal action you can take and then how can you help others with this knowledge? I'm really glad you brought that up because I think that the highest level, if you will, of owning bipolar is reaching out to help others. And I talk about that in the context that everybody is, of course, entitled to their privacy. And I'm not saying that everybody becomes an advocate on social media and have you know a million followers or whatever. I mean, I, you don't have to necessarily help others with a bullhorn. Some people are meant to do that. And some people do it very quietly, perhaps in their communities, in the, in the workplace, in their schools, in their churches, in their neighborhoods. But at one level or another, I think no matter how that's expressed, when a person does go through that experience of owning bipolar, it's inevitable that they're going to come across people that have bipolar disorder or some mental illness. There's going to be some recognition in the community and people around them. And they may be people they know, maybe total strangers, but they're going to recognize something that looks all too familiar to their own experience. And at that moment, in one way or another, if we reach out to that individual, that uh, may be in some way, shape, or form crying for our help and, and in a way soliciting our, our attention, by virtue of the fact that we've recognized that and we can offer some attention, either listening to that individual, maybe making a referral to that individual, saying, you know, this sounds very familiar to something that I went through or my loved one went through, and, and offering that connection with that person could save a life. Remember, if, if it's bipolar alone may cause up to over 10,000 lives lost just in the United States, let alone worldwide. So if we can really reach out and be unafraid to do that and share our knowledge and our experience in some way, then we've helped another person. And again, that's achieving that highest level of what it is to really own the condition, own bipolar, and share with people that wisdom and knowledge that they can pay forward eventually to somebody else someday in their lives. Well, that at the end of your book, you say, don't be afraid. You are not alone. Thank you so much for being on the podcast today, Michael, and, and really for the, the important work that you're doing to help save lives and help them th help lives thrive. Thank you so much for having me, Scott. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for listening to the Psychology Podcast. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you'd like to react in some way to something you heard, I encourage you to join in the discussion at thepsychologypodcast.com. That's thepsychologypodcast.com. Also, please add a rating and review of the Psychology Podcast on iTunes. Thanks for being such a great supporter of the podcast, and tune in next time for more on the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity.